Okay. Another really important class of ceramic materials are silicates. Silica and oxygen are probably the two most abundant elements in the Earth's crust, and so unsurprisingly, silicates, or silicon bonded to oxygen, make up one of the most common compounds that are all over the place, right? The basic building block to all of these silicate compounds is the SiO4 4 minus tetrahedral unit, right? So the silica is in the center of a tetrahedra of four oxygens all around it. That has a charge of 4 minus, right? Silicon oxygen bonds are highly covalent, so these are strong bonds. But because this is a polyatomic ion, so this group of atoms has a charge to it, um, it behaves sometimes in an ionic manner, right? These polyhedra, these SiO4 tetrahedral units, can be put together in lots of different ways. They can all be in a three-dimensional connection, right? For example, the structure crystobolite is a three-dimensionally connected SiO4 unit. You can see that all of these SiO4 units are connected. All of their four, net, all of their four corners are connected to another uh, SiO4 unit. Okay? That leads to uh, each oxygen being shared by two silica, since they're corner shared. Um, okay? Because of the structure's open nature, you can look at it, there's lots of open space in here. That leads to a relatively low density for these materials. By the way, this is like quartz. Uh, pure quartz has this uh, a structure similar to this. This is actually a high temperature version of it. Okay. Um, the strong bonding leads to high melting points. The open structure leads to low density. Now, it's also possible for these silicate units right, for these tetrahedral SiO4 units to not be completely shared by all three corners, but something less. For example, you can have an individual tetrahedra. You can have a disilicate ion where two tetrahedra are shared by one corner. You can have a chain, right, like a silicate strand. This is an SiO2O6 4 minus strand, right, that's the repeat unit there. Or they can be shared in a two-dimensional sheet, and this would now become an SI2052 minus connection there, right? So we can see examples of this. Take forsterite, the material MgSiO4. That has an example of a tetrahedra that is completely isolated. Right here, see it in blue? It's completely isolated from any others in the crystal structure, right? It's sharing with other things, right? In this case, it's the magnesium oxide uh, polyhedra, but the SiO4 are not connected in that one. But there's other ones where they are connected. For example, take acrimonite. In that one, you've got them sharing one corner, forming a little dimer. So here's our two polyhedra units that are sharing one corner, but are otherwise unconnected with other SiO4 units. You can have layered silicates, where you have this Si2052- repeat unit. That's the case in things like kaolinite clay. Most of the clay that you hopefully had a chance to play with when you were in elementary school, maybe you uh, started with a lump of clay, and when you added water to it, became plastic and flowable. That's because it's made up of lots of layers. If we add a layer to this, you'll see that this layered structure has weak bonding. These dashed lines here represent just hydrogen bonds. Those hydrogen bonds are relatively weak, and so when you add a little bit of water to those, you can get these layers to slide past one another when you hydrate these layers. But within these layers, take a look, you've got these rings of shared polyhedral units for our SiO4 repeat units. So these silicate minerals, they all use this SiO4 uh, tetrahedral unit, but you can put them together in lots of different ways. And so there's an enormous diversity when it comes to silicate structures available in nature.